the virtual machine in ALM, which was emulated from and then it compiled itself, and that took like a day and a half to make a new system slow. And, uh, yeah, and then we had a committee meeting. There's a lovely old Unix program called Ransom, which makes ransom notes. And then we needed to make something, we needed to make it go faster. And so I designed a virtual machine for this and, my, and started doing the compiler and the C emulator. I'd never written C before, actually, so um, I was really bad at C. And my friend Mike Williams came along and worked next to me. Looked at my C. And said, that is the worst code I have ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> uh, which, of course, he was right. And uh, so he wrote an emulator in C. And uh, wait a moment. This, this was emulated in Prolog and went at the amazing speed. I think it says on the slide something there. Is it? Uh, no, it went at something like four instructions per second or something. Uh, that's about what I want to show from that block. So that was back in 1986. Now, by then, by the time it's running, it was about 1992. And then, um, at that stage, we had a prototyping group inside Ericsson that was going to make a little telephone exchange, um, private automatic branch exchange, which they made in those days. And um, they're going to program. They decided to program in Erlang, but Erlang was. Um, 80 times too slow. And so we said, well, we reckon we can make it go fast. And so we, we agreed to do this project, which, which they would write all the code in Erlang, and we would make a faster Erlang, and we'd meet in like two years' time. And we would come with our faster Erlang, and they would come with all their code, and it would all run, and we'd make a world-beating product. Well, that's the idea. Uh, so we made um, one that was... Uh, of course, after about six months, I said, well, it shouldn't be 80 times faster, it would be 270 times faster, because we miscalculated. <laughs> uh, and we sort of uh, had a few like, mistakes and uh, so on. But actually, we did eventually manage to make it and go faster, and it became a product. And uh, it was sold all over the place. So the European Parliament in Strasbourg uses a telephone exchange that's programmed in Ireland, which is, is uh, not many people know that. Parliamentarians know that. They don't know the joy of having their calls transferred by an airline program. Right, let's get back to these slides here. I'm going to do, that's a bit of history, and I'm going to sort of quickly toddle through some of the things in Erlang. This is, this is um, as you might guess, I have an awful lot of lectures, right? So when I'm invited to give a lecture, I actually whip out some of the old ones and polish them off and put some new stuff in. And, and, um, so this is kind of just filler stuff, if you don't know Erlang. I don't know if it's interesting or not, but what I tell people. So I'm the, I'm the evangelist, and I go out and tell them what they're supposed to think. And, and, then, and then I read blogs, and it's great fun. Joe says that you should do this. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I find, I now, now find, they, they, I find blogs where people discuss what I meant by a certain sentence, which amuses me greatly. And they say, no, he meant this, and oh, he meant that. And I think, should I, should I spoil their fun and tell them what I meant? <laughs> but I don't, of course. <coughs> and then I want to tell you about what's fun in computer science. Um, now, not next year or anything like that, or rather last week, what was funny, computer science last week. In fact, last week, I chanced upon two things that are so much fun that I couldn't sleep and it was, like, amazing. <laughs> Even implemented one of them, and I shall show you a demo of it, which is what you should never do, is show a demo of the stuff you wrote on the train. <laughs> so Erlang was actually invented to make fault-tolerant systems with. And the model was quite simple. You have two processors. One of them does the work, and the other sends messages to the other one. These messages have the stuff you need to recover if the first one goes wrong. Very simple model. 
that's why it was invented, because it was invented to do fault tolerant computations and to build telephone exchanges which never stop. But <coughs> Ericsson is best in the world at building telephone exchanges, we need, we need to build that kind of junk. So, the next problem, well, I think we've solved the fault tolerance problem. I don't think there's anything left to do there. We know how to make a fault tolerance system. We know how to make an arbitrary uh, What we haven't solved are the problems of gluing things together. So I'm going to talk about glue. Right. So, there are two ways of gluing things together, traditionally. Um, this is the good way and the bad way, and the entire industry has decided to use the bad way. Uh, so this is a good way. This is the pipe mechanism. First, it was first seen in Unix. Um, you know this fine, this pipe, that, you know this, you all know that mechanism, don't you? Yes, good. So I, I, sometimes I start lectured by saying, hands up, everybody who thinks parallel programming is difficult. And they all put their hands up. And then I just say, well, that's a parallel program. You know, how difficult is that? Right, it's easy. Um, Parallel programming is difficult if you use the wrong abstractions. If you use the right abstractions, it becomes very simple. The pipe mechanism is the, the abstraction which, A, allows you to very easily connect things together, and B, enables concurrency and parallelism. Um, uh, the problem with this is that what's passed over this boundary between two processes is a text. It's text. <coughs> so each program has to output um, text, and then the next program's got to parse it again. So there's an awful lot of parsing and deparsing going on. That's perhaps not such a good idea. So in Erlang, the equivalent of this pipe operator is actually the pair, you know, the process one just sends something. It sends it over this process boundary where it can be received. There's no parsing involved. It's just the term is just reconstructed, so it's very efficient. And you can pass highly structured terms over a boundary between the two things. It's also this boundary here. Oh I've told you not to phone me at work. <laughs> disable this. I'll drown it. Um, yeah. If you go to Dennis Ritchie's webpage, it's quite fun because there's a, a hand. Who, who invented this mechanism and why? And it was Dennis Ritchie's boss written a handwritten memo and he said, he said, it's very important in Unix to be able to connect things together. And he said, I want you to imagine a garden hose. You know, you know garden hose, you just clip them together. So if you want to do anything, if you clip it together. And, to go through. You think, this, that's how easy it should be to connect things together. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. The reason why it's not easy is because some silly people in about the 1980s or 70s, mid 70s got this silly word efficiency into their minds. So they thought, well, I know what we'll do. It's inefficient doing it this way. What we'll do is we'll link them into the same memory space. Oh, that's a good idea, isn't it? Oh, brilliant, yeah. It means, it means that if your program crashes, then my program crashes as well. That's a wonderful idea. <laughs> it also makes it incredibly difficult to connect things together. And what else does it do? Well, it doesn't do anything well. Actually. It also makes it incredibly difficult to use different programming languages. You know, if you've written in one thing in Ruby, and the other in Perl, and then on in Python, and TCL, and JavaScript, it's very <coughs> difficult to connect them all together. Where this mechanism has been very successful is, of course, when you go distribute distributed, because that's the only way of doing it. You can't link things together in the same memory space if one's in Australia and the other's in Sweden. You have to use a pipe, you use a socket, serialize everything. And so you see that things like web services, the World Wide Web, all these HTTP protocols is the de facto way of connecting things together. That's a great idea, and it works very well. Unfortunately, they've got it wrong, but uh, I'll tell you why they got it wrong a bit later. Uh, but it's a great idea. Is now we have to concentrate on what's going down these sockets. Right. So language. Um, yeah. Oh, this is the Indo-European languages. And programming language is pretty much like this. There's like thousands of languages. In particular, it would be very good to have one language 
not, not to program in, but to describe the protocols. Because there are lots and lots of things all talking to each other. And currently, there are, uh, I checked, well, actually, this is when I gave this lecture, which was last year. At the time, there were 4,894 defined protocols on top of TCP and UDP. These are with assigned, who is it, Yata or somebody who assigns a protocol number. So every one of those represents a project, which actually got quite a lot of steam. You know, they've done it, they've written a whacking great big fat document and defined a protocol. And there's actually 4,894 of them, or there were last year. There's probably 